Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have Sarah Woodbury. Yes, we do. And it was great. Sarah is like, she has got it going on. Like not only in her writing career, she homeschooled her kids. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anybody that can do that, because I did it for a very short time. And it's a good thing my children are bright. Uh, because <laughs> it stresses you out sometimes. Doesn't well, it? I don't know that I taught them anything. So yeah, I'm sure and you're did. self-learners. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. But it was so good to talk to Sarah. She is doing some really innovative things. She has yes. a YouTube channel. We yep. talk about that and we talked, she has a really long series. We talked about mm-hmm. that and historical accuracy mm-hmm. and how when it's important and when it's not. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just a lot of good, uh, she's been doing this a long time. So she has yeah. a good long-term perspective yeah. on the industry. Yeah. She does. And the YouTube channel is for readers. It's mm-hmm. not a writer's yes. it's for yes. readers, which is so great. I love that. I, d- I don't know that there are enough of things, yeah. enough things like that for readers. So, yeah. And it's very, it was interesting to talk to her about that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So what you got going on this week? Well, uh, first of all, we have a new supporter, uh, oh, Amy right. DeLuca, and she's got the little, you know, horn with the confetti coming out of it. Thank you, Amy. Um, I know Amy and um, she's awesome. So we appreciate your support. We, su- we appreciate all our supporters and uh, I just. Thanks to everyone for helping yeah. us. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Pays for the cost of the podcast and everything. And we, that's awesome for us that so we, we just really do love it. Um, what I have going on, I am, we are recording this on May 19th. So this is like a week and a half before this is going to come out, yeah. but, uh, I leave on Monday to go to the beach to, for a writing retreat. And oh, nice. you may be thinking, Jamie, why are you going on a writing retreat? You're not really <laughs> writing. Um, I doubt I mean, people are thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in case you are, um, I will tell you that um, I'm going to be with other writers. Uh, there are five of us. And um, if I can't write, I'll just do some other business things. I'll work on my ads. I'll work on my newsletter, um, stuff like that. But really just to be around other authors and these these ladies are just incredible. They're, they're incredibly gifted authors and they are um, super successful in different ways. And I, I really cannot wait to spend some time uh, like that. I don't, I don't know that we all get to spend enough time with other authors like that in a, just a really relaxed setting where nothing has to be done except writing and hanging out. So and looking forward to that. You you thrive on being around other people and I like do. that gets your energy going. Mm-hmm. So you'll probably get ideas and things like that's right. a great like incubator for you. Right. Right. And just I think I made a post yesterday in the um Strengths for Authors group, but it just occurred to me. Now I know you guys think, why? Why would this be just occurring to you? But we were looking at I was looking at my strengths we were talking about something, but Mm -hmm. I looked at the whole list, which I rarely do. Uh, Discipline is number 32 for me. (laughs) 32 out of 34. You sound disappointed in this, Jamie. No, well, (laughs) not disappointed, but that does explain a lot of things. And in the top 10, in my top 10 strengths, I have one executive Executing. Or executing yeah uh strength and one strategic thinking strength and they're number eight and ten so is it a wonder i you know no wonder i can't get anything it's hard yeah i mean especially now with the emotions and right. all of the stuff 
that's how I function that my strengths are process, you know, I mean, kind of they're people going, oriented in a way like, right. Yes. They're like relationship oriented, right? Mm-hmm. They're all relationship yeah. uh, relationship. And was the other one? I can't think, but anyway, they're, they're not ex- executing any strategic <laughs> thinking. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So there's not a formula for me to, that I can follow to say, okay, now we're going to start writing because that's just not how, that's not how my brain works. It's not, Mm -hmm. those aren't my strengths. And so it, I can give myself a little bit of grace because of that. But on the other hand, dang, (laughs) you know, I've said it before, but Claire, Claire Taylor asked me when she found out my strength, my top five strengths. She was like, how do you even drive a car? Like, <laughs> well, I mean, that's the beauty of the strengths. They yes. do show us things and they were like, oh, now I understand so much yeah. better. So, so much better. Yeah. But so, anyway. I've always heard that like, no matter what strengths you have, Becca has always said, there's ways to make, yes. like if, even if you don't have such and such strength, there's other parts of your strength set that you can lean on mm-hmm. to produce those same results. So you just yeah. have to figure that out. And maybe that's right. what you're just doing is figuring yeah. that out in this time. I am. I am. Yeah. Becca really just, she encouraged me just to write something yeah. without the expectation that anybody was going to read it. And so I'm going to do that. That's probably I what think I'll that's do a good idea. Week. Yeah. Yeah. And just to hopefully maybe get some words flowing and stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have some ideas, but I will say that my, cre- all of my creative ideas feel really jumbled. Mm-hmm. Like it just feels like I can't, um, like I think about one story and then I jump to think about another story. And then I think about, and that is not generally how my, how I work. And mm-hmm. so, uh, I mean, like once I do commit to a project, I'm pretty yeah. focused on that project. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, you know, it just has to be all the, all the emotions. There's a lot going, going on in, on. Mm-hmm. in your life. And then there's a lot going on in the publishing industry right now mm-hmm. with things yeah, are changing. So yeah. maybe you're kind of sorting through all that, trying to figure yeah. out, you know, it's probably both things playing into, into right. play there, I guess. Right. Right. Yeah. But, you know, good news is I have um, had multiple, um, consulting calls this month and they have been great and it's just been fun to talk to people. So awesome. you know, if you're interested in a consultation, I can help uh, with a bunch of things except grammar and discipline uh, evidently. <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, yeah, I give a $25 discount to podcast listeners. So just let me know you heard, heard about it on the podcast. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't have a lot to talk about because we're doing these kind of out of order, but I do have one thing that turned out to be really cool. I'm doing, I'm playing a Kickstarter for this summer. I don't have a date yet, but for one of the things I'm trying to think of different ways I can give my readers special things in the book mm-hmm. that is not me writing more content, like writing another yeah. story or epilogue, because yes. when I finish a book, I'm kind of done with it. And so I have a hard time going back and expanding and I usually don't have like extra chapters that are worth anything. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. anyway, I decided I would see if I could find somebody to do some character sketches for me and include those in the book. And Mm -hmm. I got the sketches back this week and they look so good. I'm so pleased with them. I'm so excited to see them. Yeah. So they're going to look really good. I haven't shared them with my readers yet. Mm-hmm. I figured that would be one of the things I can use, you know, to say, Hey, Kickstarter is coming. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I found somebody on Twitter mm-hmm. that, um, he does, a con, a comic set in the twenties and he's mm-hmm. got like a Patreon subscription, I believe. And so he releases a couple of, um, pages or, um, every so often, mm-hmm. but he was posting that on Twitter and I had searched for, I think, 1920s drawings or sketches or something like that. And his name right. came up and I looked at his stuff and I was like, Oh, that's kind of the vibe that I like. Mm-hmm. I got in touch with him and he said, yeah, I can do it. And I learned that like, if you have a budget, you can tell an artist, Hey, uh, this is my budget. What can I get for this? Or if they quote you something and it's too high, you can say, well, can we change the art to meet my budget? So maybe instead mm-hmm. of doing a full drawing mm-hmm. or, a, you know, like you say, can you just do a sketch? If, Mm -hmm. you know, I can't afford, 
you know, yeah. the full drawing, or instead of like doing the whole thing, maybe you can just do one thing instead of like mm-hmm. doing a whole panoramic view mm-hmm. of something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it was very cool. And so I get that pretty soon. I've seen, like, he sent me the sketches to say, you know, is this okay? And I was like, right. Great. Yeah. And so, yeah, so that was cool. So that's going on for me. And mm-hmm. I'm um, working on Ream, trying to get that set up. Mm-hmm. And, I'm, and in a couple of weeks, we're going to talk to Jamie Davis, who's doing a subscription and Patreon. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to figure out, mm-hmm. I mean, a subscription and Kickstarter. I'm trying to figure out how I want those things to fit together. Right. You right. know, mm-hmm. so do which, I want to give which, only exclusive stuff in Patreon? Cart, yeah. Which is the cart and which is the horse? Yes. Yeah. Do yeah. I want to release my book early on Patreon mm-hmm. and then have a Kickstarter or reverse mm-hmm. it? So yeah. I'll let you know when I find out, what I figure okay. out. Right. So, and when is your kicks? Well, you don't know when your kicks It's just coming up this summer and I have a okay. lot of travel going on in June. I was like, that's not mm-hmm. a good idea. Right. And then right. I have a couple of things in July. But then I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to do it in August because a lot of that's like a busy time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it may be September again. I don't know. Okay. We'll see. Yeah. But these are that. the quandaries that I must, yeah. that we have to work through in our minds. Do I do it in July? Do I do it in <laughs> September? I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll work it out. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get on with uh, the interview with Sarah because it's so good. And yes. um, I, I just feel like uh, listeners are going to really enjoy it. Yeah, get some good ideas, new things that they haven't tried before, maybe. Yep, yep. All right, so here is Sarah Woodbury. Today we're talking to Sarah Woodbury. Hi, Sarah, how are you? I am doing great. Thanks for uh, having me. We are so happy you're here. I think um, our listeners are going to really enjoy this because we haven't really had anyone that writes historical fiction um, oh, okay. On so yeah. or not in a while anyway. Yeah. And so um, I think that it's going to be a great interview. Yeah, we're excited to dig in. So let me read your bio and we'll get started. With over a million books sold to date, Sarah Woodbury is the author of more than 40 novels, all set in medieval Wales. Although an anthropologist by training and then a full-time homeschooling mom for 20 years, she began writing fiction when her stories in her head overflowed and demanded that she let them out. While her ancestry is Welsh, she only visited Wales for the first time at university. She has been in love with the country, language, and people ever since. She even convinced her husband to give all four of their children Welsh names. (laughs) (laughs) That's That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. So how did you get into writing? Oh, into writing. So um, honestly, I wrote my first book just to see if I could. Yeah. Literally. I I was home with four children. Mm -hmm. The youngest was two. There's quite a spread. So the oldest was 14. And I just felt at that point that I needed something for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'd had, I would always been a voracious reader. Um, I just had been kicking up, kicking around ideas in my head for a long time. Mm-hmm. And just one day during um, April 1st, actually 2006, um, during my youngest son's nap, I sat down at the computer and I wrote my first, you know, pages. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, essentially Lord of the Rings fan fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I had teenagers in the house at the time. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. I always loved that myself. And so, so not historical fiction, actually. Um, very fantasy. There were elves and magic stones mm-hmm. and, yeah. and all that sort of thing. Um, and I worked on it for, for, you know, a number of months and shared it with a few people and uh, realized pretty quickly that it was, it was pretty bad. <laughs> I have a PhD in anthropology, but um, there's a vast, vast difference between <clears throat> writing nonfiction mm-hmm. and writing fiction. So yeah. Yeah. I have a 350 page dissertation. Uh, that first 350 page novel was a very, very different thing. But at the same time, writing it and finishing it, mm-hmm. such as it was, mm-hmm. uh, taught me that, that I could, in fact, do this. I mm-hmm. could, in fact, you know, write a novel. Right. I still had so much to learn. So yeah. much to learn. <laughs> well, that's how it goes, though. You have to start, yeah. though, and and you just you have to start. start and get to the end, right? Yeah. 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 So for some of us is, that that 
knowing you can do it is big, as big as anything, because, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the thought of writing a whole book just seemed so overwhelming to me and daunting to me. And I think it is for a lot of people. So when you do get to the end of something, even if it's not great, it does teach you. Yeah, (laughs) I can do this. Yeah. Yeah, I can do this. And so um, I actually wrote, I started my next book, honestly, like in July. So that was a, that was a fairly quick, I write quickly. Mm -hmm. I write drafts. So um, I wasn't going back and editing the same chapters over and over again. I was just like plowing through a plot Mm -hmm. and then going back Mm -hmm. and editing it. And and anyway, um, I, I, once, once it became clear to me that that book was never going to see the light of day, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, Mm -hmm. I actually, I had a dream where I drove my minivan into medieval Wales mm-hmm. and saved the life of, of Suella Nap Griffith, who's the last Prince of Wales. Mm-hmm. And um, it sparked the book, which is published now. It's my first published book, which is Fixed Time. Um, not me, not a middle-aged woman um, mm-hmm. <laughs> driving into medieval Wales, but uh, two young people doing it instead. Yeah. Okay. And so that was the beginning of your first series? That was the beginning of my first series, the After Kill Maddie series, which is like 20 books long, long now. Okay. Yeah. We're going to come amazing. back to that. Yeah. We're gonna, I think we're we might want to yeah. talk about writing 20 books because you yeah. have a lot more books than that and yeah. more series. So, so lots to dig into there. But first, we always like to ask everybody, um, what do you, what is your definition of success? I really value having readers who like my stuff mm. I mean, probably more than anything else. Um, that, that was, uh, that was the biggest barrier for the first five years mm-hmm. I was writing because I was, um, submitting to publishers and everything and getting rejected. Mm-hmm. And so, so five years of having only my family read my books and, um, I wasn't, you know, I'd done other things. I could do other things. I didn't have mm-hmm. to do this. Um, I think if, if I am not one of those people who grew up thinking I'm going to become a writer, mm-hmm. I do write. I, I, I grew up in a family of people who, who write, express their feelings by writing. Mm-hmm. You know, you might get a mm-hmm. letter instead Aww. of like a, call, a phone call, you know, mm-hmm. kind of thing. But, um, but if I didn't have anybody to read my books, then I would probably not, not continue to do it just Mm -hmm. because, and it isn't just that I need feedback, but it's like, it was just sort of writing into the void, Mm -hmm. which, which, um, which doesn't do it for Mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to share the stories. I mean, that was the whole thing. So I had these stories that I wanted to write down and I wanted to share. And I think that they're fun and they're, you know, and, and if I, if I didn't have anybody to share those with, then, then it would be hard to write. Right. I think, right. Um, I think that's a great answer. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, it, it, as the years have gone on and it's been 17 now, um, mm-hmm. you know, obviously making a living is nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. There's like additional goals, but, yeah. th- but that's probably the primary, primary one. Yeah. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's a great answer. Cause I don't know that anyone's ever given us that answer. Mm-mm necessarily yeah yeah I mean just that so that's really great yeah yeah Yeah. well what do you wish you'd known about writing and craft so you said that writing fiction was so much different than writing nonfiction. what did you find was the biggest difference or what do you wish you'd known oh well like dialogue and things like Mm, that you know so so I was a social scientist Mm -hmm. um I actually have never taken a creative writing class in my life (laughs) um I wrote a lot of poetry actually Uh Um, growing up um, I mean one of the things so we homeschooled our four children and one mm-hmm. of the reasons for that was um, because I did take school to its logical conclusion which is a PhD and but I felt that along the way even though I was really really good at this thing it really um, undermined my creative side Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. when I had four children and I was homeschooling them and we did not school at home, like I didn't sit them in desks and stuff. We right. was very fluid and, and um, interactive and like 
I facilitated rather than taught. And Mm -hmm. I wanted them to be creative. And I realized, so through my teens and early 20s, I would routinely say, I don't have a creative bone in my body. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and believed it and mm-hmm. believed it. Um, yeah. And so, so this, this starting to like crazy at the age of what I was, I was 36, 37, so I'm going to like write a novel. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had reached that point because I had, um, I had been homeschooling all those years and my mm-hmm. children were very creative. And then mm-hmm. my feeling was if I'm going to be, if I want them to be creative, I have to model it myself. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it would have been useful to have just a tad bit more, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> but at the same time, I had read tons yeah. of the things. Yes. Um, I spent a life of, of reading. Um, I winged it. I learned it on the, on the job. And, and yeah. probably the best thing that ever happened to me was to have my books rejected for five years mm-hmm. because it allowed me to keep writing and keep learning. And so by the time I actually published everything myself in 2011 or what I had, I had this backlog of books mm-hmm. um, that I had written that I could then go over that I could, I could look at the first book in light of the sixth, mm-hmm. you know, um, because that's how you, that, that, I mean, that is a homeschooling way of learning is that you just right. do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and figure it out as you go. Yeah. I remember figure my, it out as you go. Yeah. I remember I did get to take one creative writing class in college. And I remember we had to, you know, we read a bunch of stuff. We talked about some stuff and then we had to go write our first story. And I had not written a lot of stories before I'd read yeah. a lot, but just like the mechanics of figuring out how you like move your characters around in the scene and Mm -hmm. stuff that you just take for granted when you're reading, even though you've kind of absorbed it, it's like through a veil. And like, once you start trying to do it yourself, it's totally different. It's a big learning curve. I mean, there's just, there's so much with storytelling um, that I, that I learned, I read, you know, what I read everything I could get my hands on about, (laughs) but less, you know, I'm, I'm not a big, craft person or going obviously since I've never taken a creative writing class but like but there's certain tidbits that stick with me um things like uh Raymond Chandler's um who wrote you know noir detective mm-hmm. fiction in the, mm-hmm. and uh and he's like you know it's the muddy the muddy middle of your book where you're like what is you know you know the end the beginning mm-hmm. whatever and he's like when in yeah. doubt have someone come through the door with a gun that's so and good I'm like, it always works well I'm in the Middle Ages, so it's a sword. But you know, like that, that kind of thing is like okay, like action. Um, yeah, right. You know, things like that. I read. I really, really like Stephen King's on writing. I thought oh, that me was too. fantastic, yeah. fantastic book. I took a lot from that. Yeah. Um. So you know, just, just there was just there was a lot, a lot of years of learning, and you don't know what you don't know. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I didn't even know there was a writing community online. I mean, remember this is 2006, so this is mm-hmm. like Facebook came into being in 2006. Right. right. Um, but there was message boards and stuff. So, mm-hmm. so it was like a it was like nine months before I realized that there was a writing community mm-hmm. of all people all doing the same thing I was doing online. Um, it would have been good to get hooked into that <laughs> <laughs> a little sooner. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. You know, what's funny about on writing is I, I actually emailed Stephen, you know, the email at the end of the mm-hmm. book that you can, I'm sure no one ever saw it, but, yeah. uh, and said that, well, this was a great book, you know, I, first of all, I laughed hysterically at his stories yeah. about him and his brother. They just killed me. And then, you know, it was great about writing, but what I walked away from it with was this deep sense that. I needed to really work on my relationship with my husband because oh, our kids had just like our last one had just yeah. left to go to college. And, you know, you kind of have this weird disconnect and yeah. his relationship and the way they handle things mm-hmm. in that book was just so kind of inspiring that I just was yeah. like, okay, I we need to have a different level of communication here now yeah. that the kids are gone. Isn't that funny that that's really what I walked away from? So that book <laughs> well, is multi, uh, multi-level helpful <laughs> yeah. in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Nice. So, um, oh, I'll go. I'll okay. just go ahead and ask it. <laughs> 
<laughs> what about marketing? What do you wish you'd known about marketing? Oh, you know, so back in 2011, you didn't have to market. Yeah. Not really. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Um, yeah. so, so I, I literally, this is the story I always tell. Um, so I had a big New York agent um, who spent, you know, 2008, 9, 10 trying to sell my books. Um, and couldn't. And and to be fair, it's like 2008 and nine, you know, Bear Stearns, mm-hmm. you know, the whole. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you know, it was a mess. Um, <laughs> but regardless, couldn't sell my books. And so in the September, August, September of 2010, he gave one of my books back to me. The, the one that actually I had taken it on, it's The Last Ten Dragons. So it's yet another series and said, I can't sell it. And I was like, okay, so this is going to get consigned to the bottom of my laptop, like my mm-hmm. first book, mm-hmm. or I'm going to, I got it, I got it, or what, right? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. 2010, beginning of ebooks and everything. And, um, and so, and it's like hard to know what my rationale was at the time, but I decided to put it up um, at Barnes Noble mm-hmm. only digitally yeah, for free. Mm-hmm. And I gave away 10,000 copies in three months wow. doing nothing. Yeah. Like literally <laughs> that was content that they needed and they just picked it up. Right. Uh, in December, I got an email from a reader who said she loved the book. They would have paid for it. And to please don't give my, please don't give my books away for free anymore. Mm-hmm. Which is, of course, I still do. It's probably my main marketing mm-hmm. Um thing is I still have the first book in four of my series mm-hmm. um but uh, at that point I was like okay I'm in mm-hmm. to this and so but yeah. you know once again I published footsteps and time and sense of time like January 21st 22nd 2011 mm-hmm. um that first month sold 22 books uh-huh. three to me three to my mom three to my aunt yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> Um, but no, there was no marketing. Like, what do you do? You could, right. And, there was and, not and many honestly, outlets. And and posting on Facebook. I mean, I certainly did initially, but I, I, it came to me very quickly that that was a mistake, like spamming my friends and Facebook right, was yeah. not, not where I wanted to be. Um, so I've actually separated out my author identity from my family identity. So they yeah. get nothing about my books. Um, and then, but the next month, having exhausted the family <laughs> angle, <laughs> uh, I sold 52. And then oh, 272 in March. Yeah. But then March 19th, I uploaded Daughter of Time, which is the free prequel to the African Mary story. Uh-huh. And um, for 99 cents, not free yet, and sold um, 1,200. Mm, and that was go. all, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. Yeah. Um, so those were the days, right? Yeah. Fast forward, how many years later are we now? 12? Mm-hmm. 12 years later. Um, you know, I, I feel like what I wish I had known earlier was what it meant to be professional, mm. that this was a business, mm-hmm. right? You know, every author starts out as an amateur. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No one's paying you for a book you haven't written. I mean, unless mm-hmm. you're famous already, mm-hmm. right? And then you're not an amateur. So. Yeah. So like we're all writing in our living rooms or our desks or our little offices and, and, you know, for however long, not getting paid, earning nothing. And then, you know, it with indie publishing, you come, comes along and you can upload your book. And all of a sudden it's like out there in the world and, and like understanding the, the package. I wish I'd, I mean, I got yeah. my blurbs wrong. I got my covers wrong. I got titles wrong. I mean, I didn't have a brand. I didn't, you know, like all yeah. of those things were just like thrown, thrown out of the wall to see if it stuck, right? Mm, you know, right. it's going to work. It's just going to work. But not even understanding my own genre mm. because it wasn't a thing, you know, like mm-hmm. I, think, I think if you, if you have an agent and you get published for all that I am delighted that, that I never, you know, best thing that ever happened to me was being rejected <laughs> for five years, but yeah. I probably, I would have been coached through that, mm-hmm, which right. I did not have. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I had a bunch of friends and we're all doing it together. Right. Um, and we're all trying to figure it out together, which was great. I mean, that community of authors that I still cherish, um, you know, has, has enabled this all to happen, but I didn't know what the heck I was doing mm-hmm. in terms of marketing 
at all. Probably for at least that first year, I made all my own covers mm. with like Waterhouse paintings and Times New Roman font. I mean, I'm not <laughs> kidding. Um, but the market was I, so I, different I, then, right? Yeah. I sold 30,000 books that year. Oh my God. Times New Roman font. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So oh. I'm, so I know a lot of people have talked about like their first books and, you know, trying to get the cover right. And it's really hard when you're first starting out. Really hard. So, and I know I've gone through a lot of different covers with some of my books. Mm-hmm. So did you just keep recovering until you found one that you felt oh, was right? I oh, I have, you know, I have, I actually trying to think. So what happened was the first year I had my, these, you know, I only had three, I had four or five, or I think I actually had seven books by the end because I was mm-hmm. working on books. And then I yeah. had this backlog from five years of not getting published. Mm-hmm. Um, and in December, um, a friend who's an author now and has done very well for herself was trying to make it doing, you know, she was publishing her books, but she was doing covers on the side because she's got a master's degree from USC or something. Mm-hmm. Um and so she said, please, can I please, 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 please do covers for your books. <laughs> I cannot stand to see your covers anymore. And I was like, okay. So I, you know, I paid her and it was like two fifty yeah. a pop. Um, yeah. And um, I paid her to do my covers for the first three years after that. And then she got incredibly successful and I was her last client for covers and I fired myself, you know, in the sense of being like, you do not want to do my covers anymore. Like right. you, you're, this is not a, a, an appropriate use of your time. So she, bless her heart, gave me my PSDs, ah. so, which is the Photoshop, you know, the Photoshop uh-huh. format mm-hmm. and said, mm-hmm. and, and said, they're yours, have at it, modify, do whatever there's like, like, a lot of some cover artists, you know, they, they'll give you your cover and nothing else, right? So right you can't right. modify it. You can't make Facebook ads. You have mm-hmm. to go back to them every time. Um, I, I had a, I attempted to find another cover artist and that was really the situation. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I, I, I need more flexibility than that. Mm-hmm. And I also needed a working, she was my first artist. She was a friend. Mm-hmm. Um, Which that has know, some. Like, complications to it as well right yeah it does but we never had we had this great working you know and we we spitball ideas and we brainstorm mm-hmm. and we go back and forth and and it was fantastic um so I bought a copy of photoshop and I started doing it myself wow so 10 hours to do the first one um, <laughs> which was all it was just like and it was the pen the last pen dragons there's eight of them now um and the series is done but it was like slotting in like I, all I wanted to do was like change the color mm-hmm. and maybe put in a different image of a person kind of mm-hmm. thing. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't know. The last Pen Dragon Saga has had, I don't know, five different, you know, and, and then I learn a little bit more and I learn a little bit more and I do, and all this while I'm selling books. I mean, like mm-hmm. I throw mm-hmm. up new covers and, um, and then, uh, um, that, that series actually, I, um, another friend the son of is actually he won a, an award in LA for um for computer design and mm-hmm. so I paid him to do a fantasy mm-hmm. covers for the last pen dragon set. um I have another set of covers that um the the line of whale series which also is five and it's finished is is covers that um, my initial friend designed because that series was done by the time yeah. she was done. Mm-hmm. And, um, but the, the Gareth and Gwen's, the medium mysteries um, and the after Kamari series I've done myself and, and they've all like, you know, it's taken me years to get something <laughs> that I'm happy with. Yeah. And, and then you decide to recover a 20 book series. I mean, that it's is insane. Yeah. It's a lot I of work. I just did it again. I did it actually. Um, <laughs> I spent a last fall. I spent, I don't know. I did it really quickly too. Once I got an idea and I uploaded them all and actually I'm still, because, uh, this is nitty gritty Ingram spark, which is my uh, Mm -hmm. paperback distributor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to pay money to change your covers. And I have so many books in the series. It's taking me four or five months. Yeah. Cause you only do five at a time for free and through five. Like, yeah. yeah. So like if you're members of groups like Nink or yeah, Alliance of Infinite Authors, you get, you get codes. A month. 
Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I still have like five, four or five there that are. Yeah. There. Yeah. So it's a process. It's, it's a process. Yeah. yeah. Well, so you talked about this a little bit, but um, what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career and looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? Do you have anything, any other big assumption that you made that turned out to be right or wrong? You know, I think, um, well, one assumption was that being an indie author was going to turn out okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which it sounds like it has. <laughs> yes, it, it definitely has. Yeah. Um, you know, that, but, but if you think back to 2010, 2011, that was a massive leap of faith. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. It was, it was, you know, self-publishing. It was selling books out of the trunk of your car. That yeah. was what was the image yeah. was. And, you know, there was a lot of sort of, I had to work really hard not to apologize for it. Yeah. Really work, you know, people, who's your publisher? I don't have one. Mm-hmm. You know, that's really hard. Full stop in the sentence. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I don't have, I'm doing it myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and everybody, everybody, you know, you get looks and, and, um, and, you know, your ego just goes on, right? Yeah. Because it doesn't mm-hmm. matter what, you know, whoever you meet on the street thinks it's, it's the people who are buying your books that count. Right. And they're all over the world and there's, you know, millions of them. And mm-hmm. so, um, that, 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 that takes away the, yeah. the regret about that. The sting <laughs> you know, of the other. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So that was certainly like, and it wasn't assumption, but it was definitely like, Hey, you know where I'm doing this. Like yeah. I'm doing this. And, and, and yes, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I was told I was going to tarnish my name. Uh-huh. I had friends who who actually had that experience when working with a publisher. Um, and I was like, well, you yes. know, I guess we'll, we're going to give this a go. <laughs> um, so that was a, that was turned out well. Um, I, I mean, yeah, to, my my regrets have more to do with what I didn't know yeah. Yeah. about yeah. about publishing um, and, and mostly the business side of yeah. it. And, um, you know, of, 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 and, and, and the truth is we were all making it up as we went along anyway, yeah. because nobody had ever done this before anyway. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't mm-hmm. like, you know, Facebook ads and you're trying to do them right. And you waste, mm-hmm. you know, thousands of dollars on them because whatever, which mm-hmm. we still do. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, you just yeah. have to let that go. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Well, that kind of brings us to our next question then, which is, um, what's the most important lesson you've learned? Um, the most important lesson I've learned is, oh, honestly, in some ways, it's like anything is fixable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Anything is fixable. And I would tell this to people too, when they're just starting out and and they're, you know, they're, whether they're worried about typos or branding mm-hmm. or covers mm-hmm. or anything at all, yeah. it's like, just fix it and upload, just mm-hmm. do it again, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and, mm-hmm. and if you're just starting out and you've almost sold, you know, 12 books, then, you know, every one of How those books yeah. just seems so important. <laughs> reviews. Oh, I mean, we can talk about reviews all day, you know, like <laughs> just don't read them. Yeah. Just don't read them. Um, even like, I, I actually had an instance where you know, a book that now is 4.7 stars or something. The first review was a one star. Oh. The first one. It's like, that's oh very gosh. hard to take. It's yeah. hard. I mean, that's like the, those immediate little, um, the, the immediacy of things like that, where mm-hmm. you've just published a book and, you know, you've spent six months or nine months or a year mm-hmm. or however long writing this thing right. and something goes awry. Right. Yeah. It's like, it's recoverable from. You know, mm-hmm. pretty much anything is recoverable from, mm-hmm. um, and and uh, you know, with an apology, with an, you know, with or or just you know, upload something mm-hmm. new. It's yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking you're, about you're that. Your own business person. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was thinking about that when you were talking about like it being the beginning and like we didn't know what we were doing, but we were just doing it, and like yeah, there were things that. You know, but the thing about indie is you can go back and fix things. Whereas if you're traditionally published and something happens with that first release, then in many ways yeah. you're kind of toast. You just mm-hmm. kind of have to. You only get your shot. Right. You know, you only usually yeah, you get only like get one shot. shot. Whereas and, and, indie, and it's benefit, wide open. Yeah, 
is, is that presumably there were a lot more eyes, like professional eyes in the sense that like, this is a corporation that's publishing your book. Right. You know, you've had editors, you've had, you know, this whole thing. If the cover's terrible and people hate it, you know, that isn't on you because mm-hmm. you didn't right, have a say in it. Yeah. Um, that's, I think, one of the, one of the issues is that everything is on you. Like mm-hmm. everything. Um, you may have a, you know, an assistant, mm-hmm. or you may pay someone to do this, that, or other thing. But when it comes down to it, you own this business mm-hmm. and everything is on your shoulders. Um, right. I think that, that, that is certainly something that takes me getting used to. Um, yeah. Initially, you know, I was celebrating, I bought lunch, <laughs> you know, yeah. $20 today. <laughs> um, in, uh, in 2014, my husband quit his job oh, wow. to work with me. Mm-hmm. And that was obviously a very significant moment. And I didn't know at that time how it would affect me because up until then he's had you know we had a fallback plan mm-hmm. right. um now we don't have a fallback you know like mm-hmm. if this suddenly and you know keeping very aware that you know amazon could change something tomorrow mm-hmm. and they have at times yes. you know <laughs> tomorrow and suddenly you're you have to revamp your entire marketing plan yeah mm-hmm. um just to say like uh, so back in 2011 again Amazon December 1st or something rolled out KDP Select. Yeah. Which was their exclusivity mm-hmm. program, which is now KU, Kindle mm-hmm. Unlimited. And um, and I just spent the year trying to nurture Kobo and Barnes and Noble and Google Play and Apple. Yeah. I was like, I don't, I don't wanna, I had no free books at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. And actually there had been an incident in May. Oh, who was it? It was a a singer. um, Well, I can't remember her name now, but, but she crashed the, she was giving away her her album for free Mm -hmm. and she crashed Amazon for the day. Mm -hmm. And you don't sell books for the day. Like, Mm -hmm. like if someone had the impulse to buy your book and it's all impulsive, right? I mean, this is somebody you don't know. I'm going to download that book for 99 cents. You lost that whole day Mm -hmm. I was like I'm not going to put all my eggs in one basket Mm -hmm. and so so I decided at that point other people had been talking about it to make daughter of time free Mm -hmm. um so I you know put it to free everywhere um it went free on December 28th 2011 Mm -hmm. um and I'd been making about $3,000 a month with my Mm -hmm. books, which I thought was fantastic. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Um, absolutely. January of 2012, I made 12. Mm -hmm. Entirely on the back of that one free book. Free book, yeah. Um, Wow. That is the power of why, you know, that you can do that first and series free. And I think that's amazing. Well, I think this, like, this is a good point to ask a question that we like to ask. Um, established authors is if you were starting over today, what would you do differently? Like what advice mm. would you have for a new author just getting started? I want to say that it's a different world now than it is, oh, yeah. than it was then. Um, and it certainly is. I mean, things mm-hmm. like that I've been talking about, like, you know, you just, you know, you give away 1200 books without even yeah. reading hard. Fine. You didn't yeah. even do anything because Amazon, because, you know, everything's pay to play now, right? Yeah. Um, I was fortunate also to have this backlog of books. So I got to sort of like throw myself out there. I didn't have just one book. Mm -hmm. Um, um, you know, I would still, you know, I think it's really hard to do. It's really hard to do to say, like, for example, okay, I'm, I'm, I've got this one book. I want to publish it. I'm going to indie publish it. Um, I still think it'd be better to sit on so mm-hmm. you have three and then you okay. get to do three at one time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know, but you know, I, I, um, I see people all the time who, you know, do amazingly with one book or two books. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, it just seems, it feels almost as random now as it did then, you know, like it's, like, <laughs> right. like it's one lucky thing. I mean, I think anyone who does well realizes um, the, the effect that luck 
Like, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Like you're in the right place mm-hmm. at the right time. Mm-hmm. Um, Luck and and I mean, timing. You yeah. You can't control that. I mean, mm-hmm. what you can do is you can work hard mm-hmm. and um, put out good, consistent content. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I think a big mistake people make is flogging the one book or the two books mm-hmm. and, and not keep writing because that's where, that's where your career comes from is the production of novels. Mm-hmm. And it's easy to, to, to lose track of that and not yeah. sit in the chair and write the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one. I mean, um, 17 years in and I have 40 whatever novels mm-hmm. because you sit in the chair and you do it every day. And it's the kind of thing where, where I write a thousand words a day, mm-hmm. every day. But if I don't do that, if you know, if you don't do that for a week or two weeks or a month, it's like the next novel's pushed out another month because you didn't mm-hmm. do the little bit you needed to do every day. So, um, would you still do a free book, a first oh, series I would, free? I would still am, you know, yeah, like, like I, yeah, like that's I, what I, I, mean, I could. I, I've looked. So, I mean, I do have the one one book um so so i have the five series the the most recent series is called the welsh guard mysteries and the first book in that series is not free um and whether i make it free or not i haven't decided because now there's four books in the series it doesn't make sense to make it free when you have two um right. maybe not even three but now there's four mm-hmm. you could mm-hmm. um or i could not you know and and <laughs> and and, and, and at the moment I'm, I'm not, and I can completely believe if I made it free, I would, it, that would be like a huge launch, um, like happened with daughter of time, because all of a sudden, if, if you can get like a book bub, if you can get a, an ad or some sort of situation where suddenly you've got to get that cover before people's eyes and says, right. right you know, mm-hmm. um, so the free thing, I mean, I'm still doing it. I, it's, it's like, you know, it's the, it's the loss leader you know, mm-hmm. Walmart, or, my yeah. Walmart approach to you know, publishing. That's right. It, it makes sense. I mean, and honestly, it makes my marketing so much easier because I can go to people. Mm-hmm. You know, we've just come back from a trip to Wales, um, talking to people about writing, and I'm like, the first four, the I have mm-hmm. four free books. Just pick one. If yeah. you don't like it, you've lost time, right? Yeah. You, you I don't. And, I'm not flogging a book that I want someone to go buy. No. They mm-hmm. just they can have it for free right and then if they like it you know mm-hmm. great it makes it makes the marketing so much yes pain, more pain-free you know mm-hmm. yes because um, it's like you're offering them here take this gift and see if you like it yeah and if you do yeah. there's more <laughs> right which makes there's it really easy more. yeah yes no it yeah. makes it so and i found that from the from the jump that that was that was the the way i would do it which is why again you know kindle unlimited is not for me um you know, for all the reasons that in the past and still is that, that, that being able to do that is a, is a sort of a, it improves my quality of life. I think. <laughs> yeah. And, and I don't want, I mean, yes, people who are in Kindle Unlimited get it for free essentially mm-hmm. um, for their purposes, but then there's this all vast people who can't, mm-hmm. you know, right. they, they, they don't, don't, they don't pay nine ninety nine a month. Um, yeah. So yeah. Well, yeah. let's jump into your, like the historical aspect of your books, like the um, writing and researching historical fiction. So tell us like, for someone who's interested in writing in that genre, uh, any tips there, anything you wish you had known? Um, you just got to read a lot, right? I mean, I... I'm, I am really a stickler for accuracy. Mm-hmm. I realize that it's, people are all over the map and I think all over the map is okay. Mostly if you have a, a you know, an author's note at the end to say, mm-hmm. Hey, I did this or this, 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 but you know, sometimes people do, I mean, they move, you know, battles, to totally different years and all this people. Uh, I, I, I can't handle any of that. So <laughs> I want, I'm not going to make a battle at a different time. Mm-hmm. for my narrative purposes not when it's real history um so what i say is my books are historically accurate except when they're not but <laughs> but that's more for the, for the time the time travel alternate history stuff because i've changed yeah. i've changed a medieval world history 
Um, so, so in that sense, I can do, I mean, the whole point is that it's different, right? Yeah. But if it's, if I'm dealing with um, the other four series, it's going to be like accurate. And that mm-hmm. means a, a very um, sometimes crazily rabbit holy, like, <laughs> you know, spending an hour looking up something just so I can write one line right. about some event. And, and I'm fortunate writing in medieval Wales. Because um, in England's conquering of Wales, they destroyed as many of the records, the native Welsh records as they could. Mm-hmm. So like Truelan Ap Griffith, who's my main, you know, the, the, a genuine historical figure who's the last Prince of Wales and so on. We don't know when his birthday was. Mm-hmm. So we don't know who his mother really was. I mean, there's mm-hmm. like ideas and there's sort of mm-hmm. a range, but, but medieval Wales tends to be like that. So mm-hmm. it does leave a lot of scope for, right. um, for you know, Cre- some creative, creative interpretation. interpretation. Yes, creative <laughs> interpretation. At the same time, you know, when I come across something that's like really specific, like this happened on this date and this time, like I want to get that right. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I was fortunate again that I started being interested in medieval Wales a decade before I started writing about it, which is probably why I had the dream. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I just visited in college and fell in love with the country. And um, my dad said that um, we had some Welsh ancestry. Initially we thought it was fictive, but then we did a genealogy project for homeschooling and discovered mm-hmm. that it was real. And so at that point, it's like, okay, I want to read more and more and mm-hmm. more and more mm-hmm. about medieval Wales. So, and, and in the case of Shwellen, he was um, assassinated by the English in 1282. And right at the peak of his power, really, like at the, the cusp, the, the moment that if he'd lived, mm-hmm. Wales might have not have been conquered by Edward at that mm-hmm. time. He was running out of money. It was winter. His barons were mad at him. You know, they'd lost a couple of big battles, but they lured him into an ambush and they assassinated him. And so mm-hmm. that's, that's what I changed in footsteps in time. And then mm-hmm. history is different. And so, yeah. you know, but like the sort of deep dive into, you know, all of the, the, the reading that is required to just like work with that premise. Um, I think if you, if, if um, I think a lot of the need for research is what puts people off writing historical fiction, but it's also something I get excited about. So it's not work for me in, in quite the same way. And, and um, yeah, I, you know, totally, I, I totally understand that. Yeah. That's yeah. how I am too. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So would yeah, you say that, that yeah. would you say that like, like because like you have a big, good background knowledge of the time period so Mm -hmm. you have that basis right and you can build on that and so like you may not have to do as much research if you stick in the same time period right yes right yeah and that I mean that's a huge benefit a huge benefit to just being like I write books at medieval Wales or that medieval Mm -hmm. period so I really really know like you know anything up until 1300 and anything after 1300 is going to be really vague mm-hmm. because I'm like laser focused on this particular time period. Um, yeah. So, yeah. you know, and, and even then like um, the book I'm writing now. Um, so pretty late, it's like 20 books into this series and, you know, obviously a lot has gone on. And as soon as you start delving into like European mm-hmm. history, mm-hmm. it's insane. Like there's like a zillion little countries and everyone's got this, their own like warfares and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, Mm -hmm. I don't know enough about, you know, like, and if I'm going to just bring just even a little thread in, Mm -hmm. I need to do a lot of research in order to get to that because that's not my sort of natural habitat, um, so to speak. Well, uh, what do you wish you'd known about writing a long series? Well, that I would be writing along. <laughs> like, uh, um, I mean, when we started out, like it was clear that series are what make indie authorness kind of right. viable, right? Mm-hmm. People like series. Um, I think that people who do one-offs mm-hmm. um, struggle 
because mm-hmm. people want, you know, I want exactly the same, but different. Right. Yeah. And that's what a series provides is mm-hmm. exactly the same, but different. Um, I like series. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, Hey, it's got 20 books. Great. I'm, 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 I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, so when I started, you know, I was thinking in terms of like, but I started in a traditional publishing mindset and this mm-hmm. is like a transition from mm-hmm. a long, like thinking about long series or long mystery series mm-hmm. to everything's a trilogy, which was mm-hmm. what was going on post the uh, 2008, 2009 crash. Mm-hmm. Like right. there wasn't, there wasn't the nurturing. There was, it was like your first book has to be a success or we're dropping you kind mm-hmm. of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was thinking trilogy as I started out. And then, um, and then it was like, I can do anything I want, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I haven't any other. I don't have to be confined to the the restrictions of traditional publishing. Um, yeah. So I was pretty willing to break the rules, um, and yeah. I have like all over the map. You know, I've got books in in the same series, in first person, in third person, um, alt. You know, like. I, I do what I want mm-hmm. and, um, and people seem to come along with it, but um, there's definitely been some books in some series, you know, I've got a lot of them, which were harder to write. Yeah. Because it's like, and, and it's really, I wanted to, I do make the promise to my readers. I'm not going to just write something to write something like we've got stories to tell. And if I don't have anything to tell, then, mm-hmm. then I shouldn't be writing this Right. Um, right. And and in every single case, there are, have been certainly books where I start out like I just have to write an X after Camary book. I don't know what it's going to be mm-hmm. like. But then I get into it and it's like, oh, I know what this I know what this is for, you know, like, yeah. so yeah. giving myself permission to be like writing my way into it. Right. Um, yeah. That's going to be OK. Like, I'm I'm not going to publish something um, meaningless. Mm-hmm. but right. um but series do definitely do that to you especially the deeper you get into them and especially the more readers you have right yeah and they just they just want more and it's like it takes me a little <laughs> bit of time <laughs> it's hard to keep up with with those requests those reader yeah. requests um, yeah and I can't possibly I mean obviously everybody reads I mean no author no matter how many books they turn out can possibly write as quickly as readers read so right. you're never going to make people happy that way mm-hmm. right. but it's really um especially as time has gone on having to um sort of temper reader expectations about how many books i'm actually going to write in a year yeah. mm-hmm. and you know probably in the height of like 2016 2016 2017 i was writing three a year sometimes more because i'd had some novellas in there and everything mm-hmm. um and then uh my mother died in 2019 mm-hmm. um she had cancer the whole year before that it was a metastatic of breast cancer so she actually was diagnosed in 2011 and so on and mm-hmm. so forth but um i came to realize that i sublimate grief by working uh mm-hmm. not an uncommon thing so i was just you know work flat out working mm-hmm. and um by 2021 two years after she died i was like i, I have to I have to stop i mean and not stop but like the book that I thought was coming out in November, it's going to be January. And that yeah. just means that, you know, like every book is taking me longer to write mm-hmm. right. than was the case a couple of years ago. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. yeah, we've talked about mm-hmm. pace of writing and mm-hmm. taking yeah. care of yourself and sustainability a lot, because this is something that we see a lot that yeah. a lot of us are at that point where we're like, we can't keep up this pace and we have to kind of. Yeah ease off and, and, the gas a little bit right. you know right and so three books a year become two which is fine and people even then are like oh most people you know published authors do one book a year and I'm like, one well, book a year yeah they do one book a year um sometimes sometimes you know people like Nora Roberts or Jane Ann Krenz have three pen names mm-hmm. so they do mm-hmm. three books a year and that's how why they set up the pen names because you're only allowed to do one book mm-hmm. a year in mm-hmm. a given mm-hmm. pen name mm-hmm. so it isn't actually all that uncommon to write three books a year um, it's as a, you know, in, in the traditional world, it's just that you couldn't ever do them in the same name. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I just write under one name. So, yeah. uh, so, you know, they come out, but it is, it's like, I have three, three, three series ongoing. 
And mm -hmm. so one, one, you know, if I do, mm -hmm. I just do them in order and it's not going to be three books a year anymore. It yeah. means that there's starting yeah. more broader gaps between. Yeah. Yeah. But I think know, like, like if your readers know the books are coming, but they, mm -hmm. you know, as long as they know they're on the way, right. They're okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, I got an email <laughs> this morning and I'm like, I will have it. It'll, I, I'm promising Christmas day. <laughs> but don't ask me again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is so well, funny. You're very, um, like switching back to marketing a little bit. Mm -hmm. You, you yeah. use YouTube, yeah. uh, in a way that I don't think right. many authors do. So tell mm -hmm. us like how you, cause you use it for fiction. Tell us how you do that yeah. and how you share it with your readers. Yes. So we have a YouTube channel and I say we, because it's me and my husband. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, I cannot say that I would have a YouTube channel if not for him because he's the photographer, he's the video person. Oh. Um, we, the, so the, the YouTube channel was conceived as a way to, to do the history mm -hmm. uh, behind the books mm -hmm. um, in, in, in a way that I can't get into the books themselves. So if people right. want to delve into more, whether it's places, and because he's a geographer, I mean, Apologist. Oh, um, yeah. it, it, the focus is on it's like the history of Britain through places, right, um, well, and that's how yeah. we are. So we've we've been going every year since 2012, and so we visit a place, do video, and then you know, like so on Monday, this you know this week's video is on Shenvaglin, Saint Baglins, which is a little church south of Carnarvon, and you know we when we go there, we you know know what the the little prep is and and um and share that and it, it, it honestly if, if even if nobody watches them for us it's like we go to a place and we get to share it right mm -hmm. it's not just us wandering around a church it's us thinking about it in terms of we have you know all these people who would love to come visit this and can't but right. share it yeah. and and you know and i love that we haven't monetized it again um, you know, it's, it's, it's just a channel to talk about, well, the, the initial book thrust was making sense of medieval Britain mm -hmm. in three to six minute installments. So yes. like, you know, that, that's what it began as, as, um, a way to like, just share that history. So, mm -hmm. um, I think yeah, it's a so great it, way to like mm -hmm. expand mm -hmm. on the content of your book Yep, and pull give readers extra and then maybe pull new people in right and it has definitely done that i mean the, the truth is i had been doing that on my website mm -hmm. in text so i have like i don't even know 400 articles about various medieval things on you know chicken you know was there chicken pox in the middle ages you know <laughs> any, anything under the sun like that but without the video component and so right. um so people could go to my website and look up, you know, height of people in the Middle Ages and right. get an article that I wrote, yeah. you know, 10 years ago about that. Yeah. Um, but this this was sort of taking that concept of sort of, I know a lot about this stuff. Mm -hmm. It would be great to be able to share it um, into the video format with actual video of all these places that mm -hmm. people are reading about in the books. Yeah. So, well, if there's somebody who like really likes this idea and would like to try and do this, can you tell like about how much time like one of your videos takes and how you, cause you must have a plan when you go, right. Yes. You have it figured yes. out where you're yes. going to go yes. and what so you're going to say. <laughs> again, my geographer husband <laughs> has a map and this is just the British Isles. Right. And okay. I actually been to the South of France too, because of Templar stuff. Right. Um, it's like, well, at one point we were like over 500 places, but I think it's way more than that now. Mm -hmm. um, not that we have actually visited all those places, but when we go and we're in Gwyneth and we're like, um, uh, you know, where are we going to go? Like, we want to go for a walk. Where are we going to go? And we look on the map. Where have we not been? Oh, there's a uh -huh. milestone. Oh, there's a church there. Oh, there's, you know, and, and, um, and so we'll just go. And, um, and so that people tell us about places. So that goes onto the map. And then once it's on the map, um, we, you know, we do, a, I do a little research about it. 
um, you know, we have like the initial stick, which is, you know, I'm Sarah Woodbury and mm-hmm. I'm here today at Transadlin. And then um, once we're at the place, um, our, our goal is to be like, you know, put me in front of some feature, whether, mm-hmm. so Shan Vaglin, they've got um, the lintel above the door date is a sixth century gravestone that they've mm. embedded into the wall of the church. And so I point to it and be like, this is the gravestone of Lavernias, you know, dates six, this, this kind of thing. Um, and then if I haven't written a sort of a general script about it in advance, then I'll go do that and we work it in. You know, Dan does so much of the work. I cannot even <laughs> tell you how much of the work he does. You know, I mean, writing a script takes an hour for me. Yeah. So it is time. It's definite time. And if we think we have like 200 and some um, yeah. videos by now, you know, that represents a lot of time over the last four years. But yeah. he does the video. So that yeah. is like not yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. So I, in that sense, it's like, I, I, I know that, um, you know, there, there are authors and actually I was, I was at Mink and somebody gave a talk about having this video channel and doing these videos mm-hmm. and this sort of thing. And, and she was doing it all herself. Mm-hmm. And maybe she, maybe she, you know, farmed out some of the production to somebody mm-hmm. else, but it's her sitting in front of the video talking about something. And she had all these views and everything and, um, and she'd monetized it. So that was going really well. And, um, I mean, our channel is tiny compared to what you know youtube tends Mm -hmm. to be um but that is not my personal forte like like it's hard enough to be the one the face of it of it all Um, (laughs) you really want to see me talking i don't know (laughs) but you share it in your newsletter too right that's like newsletter content for you and yeah yeah for the thousands of people who have subscribed to my newsletter they get that every week along with, I mean, and, and, and some, some weeks we I send out my newsletter every week, mm-hmm. every week it has a video, often something else. And whether it's like a little bit about what we're doing mm-hmm. right now or something yeah. about another book or it's a new release or it's an audio book or some, right. something like that. But, but it is like, here's a, again, a free video for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, check it out. You know, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is a great way. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I do see that there would be like a ton of work on the back end of that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's a, it's like a, this whole other job for him. Um, I mean, he does Facebook for me and other things like that, but, but you know, the, this is his primary right. occupation and it's, it's a right. lot, you know, yeah. it's a lot. Um, but if, if, and, 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 you know, is there's plenty of more professional personas, you know, on YouTube. Yeah. But it would require more of my time, mm-hmm. which, um, which isn't, I write novels, you know, like yeah. that, yeah. that's the engine that drives this train mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. the novels. And, um, and so that sense, even the YouTube channel has to take a back seat. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. 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 It does. Yeah. It does. Well, this has been great. We just appreciate you being here so much. I've learned stuff and, mm-hmm. um, I just, um, uh, want our readers to be able to find you so tell them where they can find all about you and your books and all yeah. your youtube so, channel everything yeah. So, yeah so um my website is sarahwoodbury.com um super easy everything sarah woodbury so i think facebook is sarah woodbury books um as is youtube but i think i just a google of sarah woodbury mm-hmm. will get it would you. all come up it would all come up. It should all come up. Awesome. And certainly my website has links to everything on it. Great. So, That's um, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Well, that is great. We will have all those links in the show notes. So thank you for joining us today. And thanks to everybody for listening and to Alexa Barber for editing and producing the podcast and to Adriel Wiggins for doing all the admin. And we'll have all the links at wish I'd known them podcast.com. See y'all next right. week, everybody. Bye. Thanks so much. All right. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.